On February 2nd of 2013, a video went viral in the Pyrrhus since. After a news report broke out about someone saving two people from a crazed 6 foot 4, 300 pound man. The hero in this case? An almost stereotypical California homeless bro named, well, who went by the name Kai. Netflix released a 90 or so minute documentary on the incident and the shocking events that would follow in Kai's life. While I felt the documentary served its purpose in the end, it was mostly filler, and strong opinions from a handful of greedy Hollywood producers, including people for their Kardashians who wanted to poach his story rather than tell it. It was full of filler, and neglected to touch upon the most sensitive and in my opinion crucial details of Kai's life, namely his childhood, and his transition into homelessness and the horrific sexual abuse he endured. The following is not suitable for audiences under the age of 18. Plague Moth, Moth Media Productions and Associates do not condone the actions or events depicted or described in this video. The video is a critical commentary and journalistic video essay on real life events. Your discretion is advised. Kai was born Caleb Lawrence McElvery on September 3rd, 1988 in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. There isn't a whole lot about his childhood that is documented online, but gathering from what we can from Kai himself during the Netflix documentary, his childhood was at least according to Kai, filled with torment and abuse. I, mean, I was pretty much raised by the TV, I was a latchkey kid, and I was, I was hanging around in the ghettos and places where I, I grew up when I was only like seven and eight, wandering around with no, no support, no, nobody around to help me out, and there's, there's a lot of bad stuff that happened to me. Out of there, I wanted to run away, and I, I kept telling people, and people would always take her side, or they'd always take their side, and they'd be like, you gotta keep the family together, you gotta keep the family together, and I was trapped in there. All these scars are healed. I mean, there's still scars, you know? This inner child that I've guarded this whole life is still right here and intact. And I love this inner child very much. I respect this inner child. I value this inner child. And I am the dad that I always wanted. I go out camping all the time. I'm good to people. You know, I don't judge myself for what I do. I ask myself for the reasons behind it. This right here, you know, is still intact. And I, I get to talk to this little child and be like, you know what, it's not your fault. It, it wasn't you that, that is responsible for them getting divorced. It's not you that was responsible for all that molestation. It wasn't you that was responsible for all that. You just had to take the fall. And now that I'm older, I can say that. A bleak and terrifying upbringing, denied of course by his mother, who seems guilty immediately from her response to the accusations, but perhaps that's my own bias. As a child, I too endured similar abuse to what Kai claims, and can attest to the psychological damage of being locked up and isolated for unknown amounts of time as a child. Not to mention the sexual abuse and other psychological trauma he endured well into adulthood. The interviews with Kai's cousin and mother paint a picture that Kai had a happy childhood. There are plenty of photos of him smiling and being in outings. However, anyone who has survived childhood sexual abuse, or abuse in general, can tell you that a child will not just be holding a sign saying, help, I'm being abused. Nothing is always as it seems, and you never know what someone, especially a child, must endure behind closed doors. After all, what drove Kai to abandon his family and create this personality in the first place? I feel it was between the lines. Kai was in pain constantly. Escaping the abuse of his childhood and becoming Kai must have brought him relief at first, but that relief would be short-lived. After an incident where Kai was sexually assaulted by a man who overpowered him. This type of trauma most certainly causes PTSD, or in cases like Kai, CPTSD, as the trauma is related to multiple complex instances 
and patterns of abuse the brain has to cope with and try to endure. I personally believe that Caleb created Kai as a way to erase the pain and start again as someone he felt the world and himself deserved. But his lifestyle time and time again, despite whatever his intentions were, led him to older, often stronger individuals taking advantage of him. Questions rape survivors get asked in court. Hello there, people. Today I'd like to discuss what happens to people who get raped. We're discussing this to give you a very clear picture of why I refuse to testify in this case. I was first sexually assaulted when I was four years old, or perhaps a little younger, and I was brutally raped two days after my 17th birthday. A rape kit is extremely traumatic. They get you to lay on a cold table and stick Q-tips into you, then take pictures of your genitals and anus, as well as any cuts and scrapes you got from running through a forest, jumping off the cliff, and throwing yourself in front of traffic. You aren't allowed to take a shower or wash up until the rape kit is done, which means that you're required to sit in the ER with the semen of someone you hate, leaking out of your private parts and drying on your face. Imagine that. So, six months go by, or I guess in New Jersey it's four years, a trial comes to pass. You're called up to the stand to testify. First, your lawyer makes you describe to a crowded courtroom in extreme detail every moment from when you met the guy to when you got the rape kit done. As you bring that memory back to the present, all the pain and terror and shame and every emotion you associate with the rape rushes into you and you feel emotionally like it's happening all over again. When he finishes and everyone in the courtroom is staring at you, they're trying to decide whether or not to believe you. Even though you know because you were there, you can feel their skepticism. Then the rapist lawyer stands up, and he starts asking you questions. First, he tries to build you up, like he's everyone's best buddy, and you're just a wayward child with your hand in the cookie jar, about to get in trouble. They ask you questions that sound like statements, and apply things about you, like you asked for it, or you wanted it, or enjoyed it. I'll give you some examples of what I got asked when I was 17. Imagine yourself as a teenager who was brutally raped in a crowded courtroom. So, Kai, you knew that gay people went into the forest sometimes to have sex, didn't you? You were wearing clothes that gay people often wear, weren't you? You experience sexual urges, don't you? Describe the penis of the man you say raped you. What did he look like with his clothes off? Do you remember what he smelled like? Did he say anything to you? Describe his voice. What did he say? Did you look in his eyes at any point? Looking back, can you see the sexual desire he had in his eyes? Was his penis cut or uncut? How big was it? Show me with your hands. Now, show me with your hands how big around. Do you remember how that felt like inside you? Did he go fast or slow? How deep did he go? Oh, deep, huh? How long did it last? Wow, that's a long time. Did you feel any pleasure? No? Not even a little bit? Describe how you felt with his penis inside you. Did he use any lube? No? That must have hurt. No further questions, Your Honor. And that was a brief snippet of what a cross-examination of a rape survivor is like. Except in real life, it lasts much longer, like an hour. And your rapist and or his family are staring at you the whole time. What do you think about that? Kai became a viral sensation on February 3rd, 2013, when he happened to be hitchhiking with a 300 pound, six foot four man named Jet McBride. It is unclear exactly why this happened, but the two were smoking a joint and Jet McBride allegedly began to brag that he got away with raping a 14-year-old girl in the Virgin Islands on a business trip. Then it happened. Jet crashed his truck into a pedestrian at an intersection, pinning the pedestrian against the rear of a parked truck and in front of the vehicle. Kai jumped out to help while McBride remained in the vehicle at first. This is when another woman comes to help and McBride exits the vehicle and attacks this woman, choking her and holding her in a bear hug. 
and in his own words, Kai thought he was going to snap her neck like a pencil. So he attacked McBride with a hatchet he was carrying, striking him twice with the blunt end, and then once in the head with the sharp end. McBride was screaming profanities and that he was Jesus Christ. He would not die from his injuries, but the resulting interview with local Fresno television station KPMH became a viral sensation. I'm one of the yeah. heroes. Yeah. Can we talk to you? Do you mind? What do you oh. want to talk about? What happened today? Well, well I went straight out of Dogtown, skateboarding, surfing it up. Before I say anything else, I want to say no matter what you've done, you deserve respect. Even if you make mistakes, you're lovable. And it doesn't matter your look, skills, or age, or size, or anything, you're worthwhile. No one could ever take that away from you. Now, this stuff right here, I was driving in, I was, well, I was in the passenger side of this car, and he comes over on there. He was over by the recycling center. He says, oh, when I was in the Virgin Islands, 30 years old on a business trip, I, 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 uh, I saw this 14 year old. I was like, you what? He's like, I raped this 14 year old. He starts crying, and gives me a big hug. He's just like 300 pound guy. I'm like, oh, sh you must be man like what's he talking about i didn't take him seriously at first he comes driving down this way he's like you know what i come to realize i'm jesus christ and i can do anything i want to and watch this bam and he smashed into this guy right there pinned him in between that truck and so i it, i hop out i look over the guy's pinned there i mean like freight train riders know this like if you get pinned between something do not move that shit otherwise you bleed out like mother I, I ran in, I grabbed the keys, he's fing sitting there like nothing even happened. And like fing like man, if you started driving that car around again, man, there would have been a hell of a lot of bodies around here. Fing I hop on out and so I grabbed the bag, I threw it over by that pole right there, and then fing buddy gets out and these two women are trying to help him, he runs up and he grabs one of them, man. Like a guy that big can snap a woman's neck like a pencil stick. So I fing ran up behind him with a hatchet, smash, smash, smash! Yeah. The, the lady said you saved her life. She was the one who got grabbed by that fucker. You know what? Fuck is cool. That guy ain't. Shit. How, how'd you how'd you get in his car? How how did you? I was hit hitchhiking. Hit? I was well. Good thing I was hitchhiking. This is where the Netflix documentary brings in the Hollywood vultures, who describe their pain and suffering of trying to find Kai and milk his life for money. It is unknown what Kai endured during this time, in between the initial interview and when people finally caught up with him. Kai would make an appearance on Jimmy Kimmel and do a few more interviews as well. He was beloved by millions online who snapped pictures any chance they got with him. But the darker elements of Kai's life were portrayed in a targeted and biased way by the Netflix documentary. Kai clearly was suffering and putting on a mask. Behind that mask was a confused and broken individual who used drugs and alcohol to suppress the pain. This would turn Kai into an alcoholic. And while none of this excuses his actions, if you look at the elements of abuse in his life, it explains a lot. These details, however, were used against Kai in court, as well as in the documentary on Netflix. He was snubbed as a liar and a thoughtless killer. On May 13th of 2013, 73-year-old New Jersey attorney Joseph Galfi would die. The details of how exactly are debatable. Kai was offered a place to stay by the renowned attorney. Kai alleges they watched TV and drank, and then he went to bed. He claims he was drugged by Galfi, and when he awoke, his mouth had a metallic taste, and he had semen on his face and coming out of his mouth. The DA argues against this because after this incident, Kai claims he did not confront Galfi, but he was bought a train ticket and hugged his alleged assailant. Then later on the evening of May 13th, Kai asked if he could once again stay with Galfi. While this is confusing, it does not dismiss the claims of sexual abuse. Sexual abuse is intensely traumatizing and the human psyche doesn't process severe trauma like one would think. That is why PTSD and CPTSD are such complex conditions. Kai alleges that Galfi attempted to rape him again, but he beat him to death in self-defense. The DA also claims the crime scene does not suggest a struggle or self-defense. 
In fact, the evidence found supports that Kai actually brutally stomped the attorney's head in. His eye orbital bones were crushed. Nose was broken and his ear nearly ripped off. Kai was arrested for the murder three days later, and thus his story was sold to Netflix, and here we are. But in conclusion, I feel Kai is a victim himself, and his story reminds me of Eileen Warnos. It is a stark comparison, but both come from abusive households. Their childhoods were horrible, and they endured abuse that continued well into adulthood. Both also seem to have murdered in response to being raped. Both also were not really heard when it came to their stories of abuse and reasoning for their actions. And while that does not, of course, legally excuse murder, it could explain the why. In the end, Kai feels he's a victim whose story is silenced and he offers a very good point on the matter. There are a few creeps on comment boards posting a bunch of rape myths, like he was dressed like he was asking for it, or once they're raped, they're all hookers anyways. And to them I say, save that shit for the rape trials. The rapist is dead. I'm supposed to be innocent unless proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. So if there's a reasonable doubt that I defended myself against a sexual assault, I should be exonerated. I shouldn't have to prove anything, least of all the creeps like that. Caleb McGillifrey, aka Kai, was sentenced to 57 years in prison and is set to serve up to 80% of that sentence behind bars, which is roughly 43 years. If you enjoyed this video and like to see more videos like it, please hit subscribe and hit the bell icon so you get notified whenever I post a new video. Be sure you're logged in as well so you can see my age-restricted content and the, and the kind of content that YouTube doesn't want you to see. And if you'd like to support me directly as I am not monetized by YouTube, and I don't put those ads in my videos unless they're products, you can go down in the description and hit up the Patreon. There you'll get over 20 plus hours of extra content, Discord invite, merch discounts, and so much more. I love you all very much. Thank you so much for watching and supporting me. Thank you for subscribing and tuning in all the time for all these horrific videos. Stay safe and have a good one.